is a marketing session. It's uh, perfectly slotted in the day um, because after a long day, most of some of you have already left because you're tired. You've uh, sought through a lot of sessions. You learned a lot. You have a huge list of things to do. And uh, either you have too much to do to sit through another session or you're just so exhausted you don't want to listen to this one. So that's kind of true with what marketing is in the indie game area. It's that thing that's kind of left towards the end and forgotten about. So perfect, perfect mood for you guys to kind of go through this session and kind of get the main messages. To pep it up, um, in the subtitle, I use exclamation points. So hopefully that works for some of you guys to kind of get you a little bit more excited about what we're doing. Yeah, excellent. So let's go. Uh, the first thing I always ask when I sit in one of these sessions is, who is this guy? Um, that's me. Uh, if you saw the earlier session, it's not John Young's brother, maybe a little bit taller, but if you saw that session, I think it's very close. You'll also see some uh, similarities. Um, I started my career way back at McKinsey. Uh, McKinsey was a company that did no marketing. It was all word of mouth, the consulting. They wouldn't talk about the clients. They wouldn't do anything in marketing. And so you can see from their logo, very blue, very boring. I then moved to kind of Microsoft and got to work on Xbox. Those guys were a little bit more exciting, a little bit more interested in marketing, so they added colors to their logos. You know, both green and orange, so that was very, uh, very hip. Uh, I then kind of switched from the kind of world of gaming to the world of pure advertising. So they only use one color, because that's what you do in advertising, one bold red color. So Microsoft Advertising, and just like John Young, also had a stint at Massive. Again, a single red logo, so that's important. Uh, but since then, what I've tried to do is I've tried to put all those colors together and a little thing I call spontaneous quirk, which is basically a way to kind of for me to help indie studios kind of think about how they kind of grow their businesses, how they market, how they actually do better in this world. So that's a little bit about who I am. Um, so the next question is, uh, should I take notes for this session? The answer is no, so you'll be glad to hear that. Two reasons, one, um, uh, I've done these sessions before. Uh, I've sat through a lot of sessions and I've always kind of walked away kind of wondering about the one I can remember from that one anecdote, that one fact. And so what I kind of promised Ed to do is I threw up a blog. So all this content is on a quick website. It's called IndieArchy.com. In true indie fashion, it's about a spirit of indies, a spirit of people taking over the world and kind of helping out each other. It's free. It's all that kind of stuff. So this is where I put the material. I'll continue to blog and put stuff up there because I need a place to keep track of it. I did it in a true social network. So if you guys want to use it and add to it and put your own comments, feel free. But otherwise, that's where all the information is going to be. And then also you can always just email me at jj at spontaneousquirk.com if you remember all that, okay? So then, let's talk about uh, marketing and kind of your indies. Uh, the, one of the first things I did is I've been working with a bunch of indies and I tried to kind of get a profile of what the average indie marketer was like and I found some great footage of one of the first indie marketers. So hopefully the sound and all the video will work and you'll be able to see this. Thank you. I wish I could get that excited about luck. Nothing? Are you kidding? Page 73, Johnson, Maven, R. I'm somebody now. Millions of people look at this book every day. This is the kind of spontaneous publicity, your name in print, that makes people. I'm in print. Things are going to start happening to me now. Johnson, Maven R. Sounds like a typical bastard. <laughs> Sounds like a typical bastard is the quote that uh, you missed. And so, again, you know, I think the major lesson is you were going to work so hard to make this game. You're going to put every ounce of your effort into it, and you're going to have that magical day when you submit it to the store. Heard a lot about that today. You're not done, right? That's when you start. And just being in the phone book, you know, doesn't really help unless you want to get attacked by sociopaths like this guy. Um, so then I also did a little bit of research in terms of uh, apps that have been out, and I tried to plot things like their development spend, how much their budget is for actually making this world wonderful game, and their market success. Okay? I don't know if anybody guessed, but it looked a little bit like a Jackson Pollock painting. Right? <laughs> Not a whole lot of correlation at all between how much you spend to make a game and how good it is in terms of critical reaction. So then I cut the data another way. And I looked at the marketing spend, how much they actually spend marketing the game and trying to get people to uh, use it and play it and engage, compared that to marketing success. And I got a curve that kind of looked like this, which if anybody knows, that's a direct correlation. So it's actually a pretty good idea to actually kind of spend some effort marketing your game. 
Um, I then kind of cut all the data from Indies in three buckets and try to think about how people actually budget all of their spend against marketing and development and came out with three large groups. So everybody in here is in one of these three groups. So the first group is I spent basically nothing on marketing my game. Bucket group B is probably I spent a little bit and bucket C I spent a lot. So quick show of hands of your budget, be honest. How many of you in the room are in group A? You've spent almost nothing to market your game versus development, good. How many are in B? Wow, that's pretty impressive. Anybody in C? Nice, nice, okay. So if we had time, which we may do later because that gave me a little extra time. Um, if we actually interviewed you and try to get, you know, what's kind of in your head and what you're thinking about, the people in A, here are some things that you often think. My game is so good, it speaks for itself. Can you say that? Yeah, excellent. Um, somebody else might say, I prefer prayer to marketing. Some of you think parents are the best investors because that's the only people that give you money. And uh, you also think that the lottery is a great way to learn a living, right? Because if that person did it, man, that's just, that's just the way I'm going to do it. Now, if you contrast that to kind of some of the ideas in Group C, what you're going to see is actually people that have kind of been around and made success both in AAA and consumer websites. They understand that actually driving users to that great product is really important. They also turn down VC money because they don't want to, they actually want to keep it for themselves and they earn a living from video games. So again, overall this is just basically to say marketing is important. There's other things to do besides just pouring your heart and soul into development. So the marketing playbook, as I was going around to these indies, when they actually had time to do marketing, what I found is they all did a couple of things. And you've heard some of them in earlier sessions. A couple of anecdotes here. You know, I talked to, it, uh, I talked to somebody in a web store there. You know, I ran this kind of campaign. And what I did, um, I started doing is I tried to keep track of all these one-off anecdotes. And it started adding up. And what I tried to do is put it all in what I call the marketing playbook. It was trying to categorize them and add up all these different tactics, tips, things that people could actually do to market the game. Because then when you flipped it around, and then you went back to these same developers and say, okay, here are all the things that you could do to market your game. How many of, you, how many of them did you actually do? And the answer is a handful, a couple, because I didn't have any more time. I've spent it all making my game. And so what this marketing playbook is about, and again, trying to kind of post it because you're not going to remember it, uh, there is a bunch of activities in each and every one of these buckets just to think about. So what could be helpful to you as developers is when you're going through is have some kind of resource where you can just go back and check and think about all the different options that are available. Some of them may not work, some of you may not have time for, some of you may not have budget for, but they're all available to you. And that's kind of the idea behind this marketing playbook And so we have a resource in the community to share ideas, tips, tricks, and keep that kind of growing over time. So what we're gonna do in the rest of the time is a very fast move through these 12 areas of marketing in terms of trying to how to get your game to go. The first is target audience. So knowing your target audience. So if you know things about the target audience, the people you want to play the game, things like their demographics, how old they are, well, you know, are they male or female, what language do they speak? Uh, if you know their psychographics, if you know why they game, when they game, you know, why, what is gaming for them? If you know where they are, both their country and their zip plus four code, which basically means their neighborhood. If you know where they live, if you also know their favorite games and their genres, you know, the things that they like to play, and their favorite websites. So think about all those things when you're doing designing a game, you should have an image in your head of who's going to play your game. And hopefully the answer is not everybody. Because if the better it is at describing the things on the left, the better you're going to be able to do the things on the right. So if you know the left-hand side, you can do things like target your ads. You don't have to just throw up ads everywhere. You can actually be smart. You can tailor the ad creative. You can think about what those ads are actually going to work to actually bring people to my game. You're going to figure out where to advertise. You're going to help your game design team do a whole lot better job. And you're going to be able to do things like customized pricing. So right off the bat, you've got a lot of ideas of what you can do better by knowing your user better. And you can see these numbers are going to keep growing throughout the presentation. So there is 13 things to kind of work on after you've made a great game. Then you can think about the next area is game design. So realize a lot of the tactics for marketing you couldn't do unless you actually built something into the game. And so they're basically feature requests, platform requests, infrastructure requests that you had to get in the overall game design pipe to think about. Things like a free mode, right? Things like, is my game easy to learn? Can people kind of quickly get through it? Are there compulsion loops to get them to come back? Is there an achievement system for kind of the, uh, um, my favorite term, achievement whore? 
um, for that kind of class of citizen? You know, are there incentives for them to invite their friends and get other people to kind of bring into the system? Is there an upgrade path? Is there a way for them to go from one version to another version? All those things are game features, things that you have to think about and design. And if you do, then you can actually run marketing programs against it. Besides playing the game, you also think about simple fe features around sharing. But again, each one of these is features that takes work in the schedule to get done. Connection to Facebook, connection to Twitter, some kind of brag button where they can take content from the game or progress in the game and kind of show it off to their friends. Uploading screenshots, right? Simple feature, take a screenshot, send it to friends. A little bit more complex feature, you know, take a quick uh, snippet of gameplay video, post that to friends, post it to YouTube channel. Uh, if you looked at one of the, my favorite examples is if you looked on uh, MMOs like Rift, did a great job of this, made it very simple and easy to actually people create, take game content and post it everywhere. Multiplayer, huge feature. A lot of people think about you know, that as a big binary decision to design the game. One, I'd say the more multiplayer it is, the more you're going to be able to market down the stream. But I also try to kind of put these in orders of how valuable it is to marketing. Leaderboards are nice. You know, it's a little bit valuable. But clan-based gaming is really nice in terms of actually being able to draw marketing features and campaigns around the, the, those features in your game. And so it kind of moves kind of through the progress. Um, the other idea is while you can do all these features by yourself, you can write your own code, you can kind of use native stuff, uh, there's a value to actually connecting off-the-shelf services, whether it's Game Center, GameSpy, OpenFaint, whatever it might be, because from a marketing perspective, all of those already have installed bases of users, right, that you don't have to grow organically. So you kind of think about a head start. So you might think about just doing one to enable multiplayer. You might think about doing five to tap into all those installed bases. Behind the scenes, from a game design perspective, things that you can think about in terms of your sign-up process. Did you capture an email? Okay, maybe you're thinking about ways to get around it or use some other kind of you know, one-off sign-in. But if you capture the email, you can do email marketing. If you don't capture the email, you can't do email marketing. So just a good, simple thing about what are the features that you need in your game. Are you going to have push notifications? More work, but man, I can use it once I have it. I'm going to get my game rated. Is there something in my game flow that actually makes people rate the game, reminds them to uh, rate the game, or incents them to rate the game? Uh, in-app ads, we're going to talk about that a lot later. But from a game design feature, where are your in-app ads going to show up? How many screens? Where on the screen? How much of the real estate are you going to give up for these in-app ads? You got to have it. You got to think through that. Your analytics integration, in terms of knowing what the game is, there are lots of analytics engines out there. Are you going to plug in one of them? Are you going to plug in multiple of them? You know, which ones are you going to use? Because if you have that data, you can use it. Um, some other things that are kind of in terms of behind the scenes, but are more from a process perspective, and some of them have been touched on in earlier sessions, thinking about basically doing betas outside the US. Canada keeps coming up as you know, a favorite. Uh, beyond that, you know, we also heard about high quality launches. You know, try to get out there without bugs, because you don't want to get you know, competing for the rankings until you have a good game. Um, other things to think about just from a process standpoint, frequent quick updates. One, from a marketing perspective, remember every time you get that update, you get that little, in iOS, you get the little red signal that you have an update available. That's one more reason when a user is flipping through their phone to actually go hit your logo again. Geographic test beds, kind of talked about, and then a privacy policy. A little bit of extra work, but if you're going to do marketing, you've got to do a privacy policy, especially if you're going to use user data in that marketing. A big section around game design is back to that data collection. You think about the raw material for great marketing is that targeting data. And you have to capture that data, you have to manage it, you have to store it, you have to kind of scrub it. And there's lots of different flavors, sorry for the colors probably don't show up very well on the screen, but different flavors of data that are all valuable to marketing down the, downstream. Gameplay data, right? What the users like and what they don't like from a preference perspective. Demographics the social graph that they have through Facebook or their friends list on any of these multiplayer services. And then one of my kind of favorites that I really haven't seen, um, so it's nice that it's a little bit grayed out, uh, I call it post-session feedback. You know, and how many games have we ever asked the user directly for their feedback? Positive, negative, what could be improved, what they're having fun with. Right now we infer a lot, but we never ask. You've got a two-way street of communication with that user. Why not ask? Beyond game design, uh, another area, web links. So I know we've talked a lot about acquisition, about driving users to your game. But think about once you have an app to actually drive users outside of your app onto the web. 
So first, places you can drive them. You can send them to a dedicated site about your game. You could send them to you know, a marketplace to buy things for your game. You could send them to, you know, if you're a developer you know, with many games, you can send them to the developer's website. Or if you've hooked up with the publisher, the publisher's website. Okay, so you're sending people outside of your game onto the web. Why do that? Why is that important for marketing? What's interesting from a targeting technology basis, if we can connect the player ID we have in the app with a cookie on the website, because you drove them to the web through a browser where you can drop a cookie for some way, we can connect those things and then do really cool marketing on the web. So when that user has actually played your game, put it in their pocket, hasn't thought about it for a month, you know that from your gameplay data, and you've had them go to the browser so you have a cookie, you can actually go back and now say, send those reminder emails to actually maybe come back to the new game because you have a new feature, you have a new launch, you have a next wave of installed pack. Right? So those are things that you, you can't do any of that, though, if you don't set up the infrastructure. So that's why this is in game design. In uh, respect of John Young, again, earlier in the day, he was looking for this picture. I found this picture. So marketing assets, guns, I want lots of guns. Um, the next section in kind of the marketing playbook is all the assets that you need from a marketing campaign. So, and you need lots of them. And so you think about having this ammo box or inventory or armory of all the different marketing materials you need to run our marketing. So that's the next section that we're going to go through in terms of the uh, marketing playbook. First thing, trademark name. Galaxy on Fair, trademark. So what's important is once you have a name, you're going to build some credibility behind it. You don't want it to be somebody else's name. You want to protect that name. So going through that steps of actually trademarking your cool name is pretty important. You need a cool logo. My apologies. I obviously sent this logo in last week when the uh, slides were due. So didn't kind of forecast what was going to happen this weekend. So that's a little bit of a bummer. But so I'd ask you to just, since it's up there, you know, one, we should kind of hopefully take a little bit of a moment and think about uh, those families and communities that kind of shaken up this weekend. And also just kind of think as artists and creators, you know, what we're kind of putting out there in the world. But with that aside, you got to have a cool logo, and this was a pretty cool logo. Eye-catching icon. What is that icon going to look like that's on the screen deck and in the app store? You know, that's maybe the only thing that somebody's going to see to actually download and install your game. So is there something interesting and cool about it? I'm not sure what this is, but maybe I'll click on it. A catchy brief. Another thing that goes in. You're going to write this over and over, and it's going to use in lots of different ways, that one paragraph description. But that's also something that's going to get shrunk up and only be a couple lines. So think about having highlights like what is the you know, five word you know, power byte that's at the top? You know, what are the proof points like game of the year or marketing references? What are the highlights in the game? But again, this is material that you should just always have on hand about your game. Pretty screenshots. Wouldn't be a game without pretty screenshots. So think about taking the best in your game and actually uh, putting it up. Also thinking about using those screenshots as another way to tell the story that you may not get across in the brief. This one does a really good job of, I almost understand the entire game just from going through the series of screenshots. So I don't have to read any text. Maybe I missed the video, but in five screenshots, I kind of get a sense of the game, what it looks like and what it plays like. 30 seconds of awesome. So this is back to do a trailer. You've heard in Kickstarter, you know, it's basically the trailer is the only thing that really matters. Um, your game's the same way. What is that 30-second trailer that if somebody, if that's the only uh, you know, thing that they're going to see that's going to grab them and hook them? But beyond the 30 seconds of awesome about your gameplay, think about uh, dev videos. Think about if you got ever interviewed, capturing that interview. Think about any, your users talking about your game. Lots of different ways to capture your community in video and kind of capturing that and playing it back for your users. So that goes into the armory as well. Next section I'll call action, catchy name. Actionable trigger messaging. So this is an idea that for all the campaigns you're going to run and all of the tactics you're going to use, they all are going to have a message. And that message needs to be actionable. You want the user to do something. And it's probably going to come after some kind of trigger. Something that happens in the ecosystem like you just launched a demo and you want people to download it. So your message is download the demo. Your marketing team, you're going to have lots of these because all of these things are going to be happening kind of simultaneously. And as you think about managing a large installed base, you're going to be sending different messages to different people. So having this library of these trigger messages that's always ready to go is kind of important. And you can fill in the blanks. Clickable banners. So now that you have these messages, you're going to put them someplace. If you're using display ads, there's a lot of formats and actually creative art that needs to get done to actually create the ad itself. What does it look like? On this page, this is an IGM wedge page. The uh, display ad is the bottom right. 
IGN self-service ad buying, reach a million, start here, right? So somebody had to create all the art and the assets. Uh, and the other important word besides banner on this page is clickable. When I click it, it goes someplace. So that's an engineering task and it requires more infrastructure in terms of I need to build a landing page. So when I click it, what is the destination either on my website or somebody else's that gets created? So again, lots of steps that go into creating a very simple WAD that somebody has to do. A keyword library, um, which is very important for almost all targeting you do. Anytime you eat, use an advertising platform, they're going to ask you for ways to target and that's basically going to be keyword generating and you're going to have this long list of keywords that you're going to input into all those things. So your keyword library is your identification to all these advertising networks, keeping that library of all those words. A lot of them are going to be generated right up front when you do the audience analysis and they got the first page. It wouldn't be marketing if we didn't have comfy t-shirts. Who doesn't love a zombie campfire? I do. Brains on a stick, anyone? Uh, but don't forget your t-shirt is not just for you, it's for all kinds of people. Men, women, big, small, short, kids, whatever it might be. So think through your holistic t-shirt strategy. And then lastly, uh, tchotchkes. You can't have marketing without tchotchkes. And I think I grabbed one from today. Anybody see this guy? He's pretty cute. I'm not sure what he is, actually. Um, because I would, what I'd ask to ask for tchotchkes is that, one, they're cheap. I think this probably qualifies. Um, memorable is good. Useful is even better. So what's on the left, I'm not sure you can see it, but if it e at E3 this year, Bethesda basically had a cardboard box, really cheap. What is it? It's uh, speakers. <laughs> you take the cardboard out, you construct a little cardboard thing and plug it into your iPod and you've got a speaker. Cool, memorable, cheap, useful. Good tchotchke, almost as good as the addicted tchotchke's coffee cup. The next section, uh, marketing playbook, pricing. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because there's books and classes and everything else written about pricing. But when you think about it from an indie developer standpoint, don't think either free or just 99 cents. Think about a range of what you're going to do with the pricing. You're going to have a free entry vehicle of some sort, yes. But then think about good, better, best. What are different levels of pricing for different people? What are different prices in different geographies, which is possible? What are, what are the discounts that you're going to hit by certain triggers? Maybe it's three months after your game launches. Maybe it's a month before your next game launches that you're programmatically going to drop your price. Think through that. And calendar-based discounts. What are my specials? What are my holidays? What are the things I'm going to do for my price organically? Again, somebody to think through all those issues. Next section, the playbook, website. Got to have a website. Got to be about your game. This one is uh, Angry Birds Space website. If you haven't seen it, I encourage you to go check it out. Um, it is pretty cool just as a, it's the funnest website I've ever surfed. It's not the game, you're not playing the game, which I'm sure you'll do in the future, but it's a great way to navigate a website. Totally innovative approach. Hook me in, maybe you want to maybe download the game a little bit more in terms of learning about it. A lot of work to do. So again, you could spend a lot of work, you know, doing your website, but see what else is out there because that's what your competition is. If you think about in terms of back to the work of the playbook, I have a website, but what are the things I need to enable on the website? It's things like that cookie. We talked about that before. It's things like getting them to log on so I know who's on my website so I can connect the dots, knowing where they came from, where they're going to go next, having all those ad-specific landing pages we talked about, uh, a landing page for each of my games, of course. Um, I'd love to give my users a way to manage their profiles and show their leaderboards and connect to social networks. And, and of course, they don't all speak English, so I need to translate it. So again, Wow, I need to know have a website. A ton of work that needs to go into a good website around your game. Besides features, behind the scenes, content. What's going to go on that website? Devlog, hopefully. Marketing assets, that huge armory. That's obviously your showcase where you're going to put them all up. Uh, your current promotion. What are you trying to sell this week, this day? Um, review links to everybody out there that talks about your game. Help videos. You know, right now they're going to go someplace else. Why aren't they getting to those help videos through your site? Um, fan site links for people that actually are already talking about your game to help reinforce that. And app store links to actually go buy the game. So all these links need to get built in and all this content needs to get created. So you got to keep it fresh. And there's a lot of work that goes into that. Beyond the actual website for your game, there's other internet uh, presences that you need to manage, create, and, and host. A Facebook fan page is an obvious one. Uh, beyond the Facebook apps that allows you to connect your app to Facebook, you need, you know, a Facebook fan page is good to have. Twitter accounts, uh, Randy Pitch from, from Gearbox, 
you know, basically constantly hits Twitter and says whatever's going on in the studio or hits his community. Um, he's got, uh, what is it, 11,000 followers on here that basically, you know, is his first line of defense whenever he has something to say on the internet. And a YouTube channel. Maybe especially for people as they kind of grow content and grow, grow a franchise, think about all those videos that you want to curate and make it easy for people to find, right? Easy to people to find and put together so they can see all the great things about your game. All those 30 seconds of awesome. Next section in the marketing playbook, evangelism. So I think this was Dave Ettery's favorite and only marketing tip. I get out my megaphone and I go talk to the app stores and I beat on their door until they promote me and put me on the first page. Excellent strategy, definitely do that. Don't just do it with Apple, do it with all the stores. But also take that megaphone since you got it out, talk to all the reviewers, right? Talk to all the media, maybe it's your local press, maybe it's a business press, maybe it's the trade press, uh, and talk to the community. So back to, and this came up in Kickstarter uh, discussion earlier, you've got a large community of people thinking about your game already, you know, watching you, you gotta manage and, and communicate with them. So now think about all the work that goes into just evangelism, those sports steps, because man, I can spend all my time you know, talking to other people. Funnel management, next section in the grid of the marketing playbook is funnels. So you think about knowing what your funnel is, creating it, and designing it. Hopefully in the design process, you've almost architected from the get-go. But then from a marketing perspective, you can think about waking up every day, checking out the data in today's funnel, and taking action. So here are some example actions of what you can do with the funnel. Fix the leaks, you know, it's kind of obvious number one. Um, as you start to see players lose interest, figure out what interventions you can take. Um, when you see that users actually lapsed and gone away, what are the programs and promotions you can actually run to get them to come back? Um, for the players that are actually having a good time, maybe how do you nudge them to buy more or play more or invite their friends? Um, and then for people that uh, are your most loyal, always making sure they're, they're your first line of evangelism for the next wave of content, that next release, that next drop. And then in terms, oh, I missed something. Interesting. Uh, if you think about this, this is again, funnel management is about um, users you have, they're in your funnel, right? So you know their IDs, you know ways to connect, uh, and they're using your device in some way. So the important thing here is this is a good marriage between those actionable trigger messages that we talked about earlier, and all of the personalized delivery vehicles that you have at your disposal. So think about almost setting up these programmatic loops of if this, take this message, send to this user through this vehicle. There's push messaging in a vehicle. Your email management system is a vehicle. In-app house ads is a vehicle. Text alerts, and again, it's grayed out, but you know, things on their website. You know, your, your website for you, when I log on, you can customize to me. Again, you can match up, trigger acts a message to my ID based on my performance in your game last night. All possible if you set it all up. So then moving on to probably the section that people like the most, which is, okay, that's the funnel of users I have. Now how do I get more eyeballs into the funnel? Right? Isn't that marketing's job? It's like, I made a great game, so come bring me some eyeballs, please. So this is kind of run through what are some you know, popular ways that you can kind of actually get eyeballs in your, in your system. First, starting out with, uh, you know, you've got friends, right? <laughs> the people on your team all have a Facebook account, all have a set of friends. Are they using it, you know, actually sending messages out to their groups about whatever's happening? It's an example from a uh, robot, I think, at Patrick at Ro at Hudson. He, he loves to send, I think, all his Facebook in, uh, posts are about, you know, robot entertainment, but I'm sure he has a life outside. Uh, your friends, uh, the, fr the people that play your game, they have friends as well. So make sure your game is actually taking advantage of all the hooks that are provided to actually notify that either automatically or directly. And give your users ways to easily have content that they can share with friends. The bottom example is, you know, you imagine saying out releases that other people can like or share and, you know, spread for you on your behalf. Marketplace promotions. I heard somebody damning the Steam Summer Sale earlier today, but I love the Steam Summer Sale. That's great. You've done, a, you've done the uh, work of getting your app into the store. That store's job is to make money and try to get as much money as they can and they're constantly running promotions. To run promotions, they need content, your content. So as part of your evangelism to with that site, not just to get on the site, not to get on the promotions, not to get on the uh, you know, top ranks or what's new, but get involved in promotions. So think about that management to be a part of those. App of the Day Networks, that comes up. Um, there are you know, a couple examples up here of uh, some popular ones. This is basically the idea of um, 
buying some traffic for a day. Maybe I have to give my service away for free that day. Maybe I don't. There's all different kinds of deals, but there's lots of networks out there that will take your money to you put a whole bunch of users to get in front of your game. A little bit less direct, but the kind of the same goal, recommendation engines. So another idea is, you know, uh, most stores have the collaborative filtering tools in the background. If you like this, then you'll like that. You need to kind of tweak and, and watch those systems to see where and when your game shows up. But then there's some active management you can do with services that are on the outside. So two of my favorites are Decidertron. Uh, I think it's a combination of PAX and EDAR. But it's basically a third-party site that took game data, has users populate you know, what their history was, and then they do all the matching in the background. Is that, so the question for you is, does your game show up in that? And where does it show up in that? Same for Hook does that for kind of mobile games. Obviously, you know, the, probably the biggest uh, driver of eyeballs are the stores themselves. That's why they take 30% of your revenue. So when you think about you know, iOS, you know, a little bit of debate about whether it's iOS or Android, uh, a lot of you people think about iOS first. But my point for the marketing uh, playbook is you've done one, congratulations. Um, there are a bunch of others, right? Your game can be on all these. The downside is that's more work, that's more submission processes, that's more people to evangelize and schmooze, that's more people to kind of promote. But it's, more, it's also more eyeballs, more customers for you. Another way you can think about is something, search advertising. So you can think about when people are searching for something and want, do I show up, am I easy to find? So I went up to, uh, had a friend launch a game, tell me about last week, he calls me up and says, yeah, we just launched this iPhone game, it's got Jennifer Lopez or something, it's called DancePad. So I'm like, great. So I go hit my local search and I enter DancePad in there, which you unfortunately you can't see. Um, and you got back, obviously something you can't see either, but what you, if you look through there, trust me, uh, that game that you just launched last week, Jennifer Lopez, does not show up. So that's not very good. So I'm not very easy to find. Two ways to kind of correct that. One, search engine marketing, SEM. So that's basically buying the space, buying the keywords, and you're going to show up on the right and the top. And uh, basically Google's the best way to buy that, being kind of a, also a good option. But right now, it's kind of interesting. DancePad, if you would have bought DancePad at probably any price in the auction, you probably would have got it. Um, since you didn't, they didn't. Uh, and by default, it goes to the next best bid, which was um, Dance Toe Pads. So they beat you. And uh, Dance Praise Pad, which I'm not quite sure it is, but um, they outbid you for your keyword for the time of your game. So again, you feel if you put enough energy into this game, you should own that space. The other way to do it is the organic part of search, which is called SEO, search engine optimization, which is basically working your website, that thing we designed a little bit earlier, to making sure when the search engines crawl it, you come up to the top of that result. So when people enter at DancePad, you show up to the top. So there's a whole library of work that you can go online and search for and you'll find out. But there are also companies like SEO Moz that basically work with small businesses to make that easy. So you show up in those results. Another tra traffic acquisition, display advertising. Some people like it, some people don't like it. This is an example from 148apps.com. You imagine people trying apps of the day. Um, what's good? The stuff on the left is editorial, you know, that some you know, reviewer put up and talk about apps. You can see the size of the banner of the, I think this is the NBC Olympics app. So you see the size of the banner. And right next to it, you see the size of the banner for Airline Tycoon Deluxe and I See You Baby. So those folks you know, bought the ad space to get basically the same real estate or even better than uh, Launch Olympics apps. And like some people may not like the economics from a user perspective. I've been in display advertising. It works. That's why people do it. That's why people buy it. You could buy it too. There are lots of ways to buy it. Google AdWords is a great one. Um, lots of networks out there to kind of buy advertising from, both generically as well as specialty sites like IGN and GAO. Um, so plenty of places to buy display ads from. One special call out, one of the things I did at Microsoft is trying to, uh, which I'm still trying to kind of get the industry to adopt a little bit more, is this concept of retargeting, which is the idea of I'm not just targeting you based on keywords or where you live or what you're interested in, but based on what you did before. So I just closed a shopping basket in Best Buy. I gone, went to another site and all of a sudden I see a Best Buy ad surprisingly for that product that was in my shopping basket. 
that's interesting. Maybe I'll go back and I'll, I'll return to that shopping basket. That's an example of retargeting. This example is for World of Warcraft. Basically, people that knew World of Warcraft users and accounts, when they're surfing their email, instead of seeing whitenmyteeth.com or whatever might be in that email campaign, it's World of Warcraft just launched a new upgrade path. Wouldn't you like to check it out? So as a user, you can think about, I've got to see ads anyway. Wouldn't I rather see ads for games and things I like? Yes, and people do this. Um, recent, just as I was writing this presentation last week, um, you know, what hit into my box was AppSolar, which is one of the analytics companies, actually announced doing retargeting for mobile. So all within the mobile space. So same technology, same benefits. You know, those are the type of things that you can look into. Then we get to in-app ads, which I think is the other thing that was mentioned earlier on a panel about sharing traffic, you know, basically from one app to another. Um, some people have some allergic reactions to in-app ads in terms of selling out. They don't want to sell out their real estate, sell out their users. So my first kind of talk about that is that real estate can be used for house ad messaging, right? Having the real estate doesn't mean you have to put a, a down, uh, you know, a Dove ice cream bar ad on there or some car commercial or Axe, you know, body spray. You can use it for your own stuff. You can use it for that new content that's coming out. You can use it for the microtransactions you got. So use it for, use it. <laughs> Create it and use it. And a lot of different ways you can use it. Then you can think about using it for other people, taking your users and sending them someplace else. And even there, there's a spectrum of where you can go. So start out easy with inside your own developer. You know, that's pretty easy. Um, inside your own publisher, if you have one. Friendly apps, you know, that's what the guys on the panel were talking about er earlier, just that you try and, and then you can maybe turn it over to an app network where you're not quite sure who's gonna take advantage of that ad. Uh, but the upside is you'll get paid for it. Or at least be able to use it to trade in kind to get traffic sent to you. And there are a bunch of networks out there that do things like that. And then one of the last, um, one of my favorites too, in terms of uh, marketing is, especially for indies, is you have really tiny budgets um, and not a lot of time. There are a lot of other people out there that have a lot of time and a lot of budget. <laughs> and they see your content as great and your games as great content for their ads. So think about device, device manufacturers, and I'm trying to sell that new Samsung phone, and one of the ways to get buzz for the consumer is this cool game that you can play on that Samsung phone, right? And to have you, know, you be as part of that advertising, that's TV advertising for you. So making those kind of relationships can be huge. Same with service providers who are trying to differentiate themselves, or app stores who are trying to differentiate themselves. You know, all these people are all constantly looking for an edge over their competition, and maybe you can be you know, part of that. Or then, you know, last is uh, also think about consumer brands. So maybe you have uh, an Angry Birds knockoff with turkeys, and you can kind of find a consumer brand that sells turkeys, and maybe they want a game that's about turkeys, and they'll pay you a lot of money to do a Thanksgiving promotion when all the turkeys are sold in the nation. So be creative. You can think about different people that have marketing budgets that could use you as content, which makes, gives you free marketing. And then last, uh, traditional media buys. You can always buy eyeballs the old-fashioned way, TV, radio, print. You can put signs on buses. I was talking to Christopher earlier, and I said, I saw your summer camp ad on the back of a bus. And he's like, oh my gosh, did they really do that? I did not know. And the interesting thing is, yeah, people do it because it works. Um, a lot of people would look at these kind of options and say, oh my gosh, come on, forget it. I'm an indie studio. I don't have a budget to do any of this kind of stuff. Because they think TV, they think... Um, they think American Idol, they think Super Bowl ad. For all of these, there is a local versus national spend. There is a targeted versus untargeted spend. There is a off-peak versus primetime spend. So there are budgets and opportunities for all these. And the reason I say that is because if you're following some of the good game design lessons to create a truly viral product, where once I get a couple of users, they spawn other users, all I need to be is a really big fish in a small pond to begin with to get that flywheel started. So maybe I'll take over the buses on a college campus for one, one weekend. And that will be the start of all my rest of my viral marketing. But I could own that space or that one billboard that's on a perfect street corner. You know, it doesn't make sense at scale, but it could make sense at launching a viral community. So that's it for kind of uh, 129, if you've been keeping track, I hope you have. 129 things to do once you've made the world's coolest game and you're tired and you're exhausted and you've, uh, you're not quite sure when you've slept last. But once you get all those done, I'm sure you're gonna drive a lot of traffic. Um, I have to also be respectful because a lot of these ideas were good at one point, uh, but are not so good anymore. And so 
some of the things that used to be on the list that kind of got knocked off. Hey, those botnet downloaders, those worked really well. Okay, let's not use those. Um, spam, that works really well. Don't be that guy. Um, violating my privacy policy, you know, telling people I will never, ever, ever do anything with your data and then doing something with their data, don't do that. And then incentivize installs, that was a really good idea. Apple said no, Android doesn't really matter, so that's still a good idea. But you know, keep, keep abreast of you know, things that were good ideas may, may fall out of favor. So watch out what, what goes from good to no-no. Okay, so to wrap up, 12 things in the marketing playbook, 129 things to get, to get done once you've kind of finished the world's coolest game. If you want to go, if you can't remember any of these, you want to go look about any of these, you want to discuss any of these, that's indiarchy.com. Have fun with it. Do whatever you want with it. It's free. And, or just email me at spontaneouscourt.com. Cool? A few questions and then off to a coffee break. Way in the back. Um, uh, that's, that's almost counter to why I did this, because this is meant to kind of show you the landscape of what you could do. So you as a developer, as a team, could go and decide exactly that where to spend your budget. Because they're not magic bullets. Um, what I think is interesting about using this as a discussion forum and trading, not on an anecdotal basis, but someplace where we can all go, um, all go have those debates, that's what that website's for. Right, so we can all go and discuss which of those in-app ad networks actually gave us the big deal. Hey, of all those free ad networks, which won't actually tell you the rate, they basically say, show me your game and I'll tell you, because then I'll tell you how much I'll give you for it. Um, to actually share that learning behind the scenes, that's exactly what the communication's for. So what the marketing playbook is just basically to show you the, the, all the stuff that you could do, so then you can kind of experiment what works for you. But you're never gonna run out of new ideas. Was there any I think uh, what, I, what I think when you go through the list of the 129, in terms of there's really, you, you would not, yeah, I hear what you're doing, you want to kind of approach it from an engineer, put all 129 on a list and do the ROI of them. Um, what's going to be hard is each one of them, the way I set up the list, each one of them, you could put, you could hire an individual to spend their entire life, you know, that year working on that area. Let me see, uh, let's go, Let me Work, working, the, working the angle on getting that device manufacturer deal, right? And if you got on there, you would be done, and that person would be super, super cheap, right? That would have been the best thing you could do if you got there. So those are the bets that you're making, and you're going to make those bets based on who's in your studio, their passion, their skills, and what you think you have the access for. So that's where... I'm not going to do the thing which everybody wants, which is, can you please now stack rank the 129 on a list and I will work down, down the list. It doesn't work that way. Yeah, what, what I, I think I've noticed, kind of working with the indies, is each of them tries an anecdotal sample of a different thing. And then they have success or not, and then that informs their opinion. And they've had one attempt at the Apple. I think back to this reason for the marketing playbook is to get more insights to the overall shotgun approach. So then when you add up everybody's experience, you start to get better learning. I mean, we don't have it now because no one on the planet has done all 129 things, right? So this is where I think we're in this stage in the industry where it's so anecdotal because no one's spending really any time on it, uh, and we don't actually sharing our learnings in a, an effective way 
which is why I wanted to put this playbook together so everybody could actually kind of work off the same page and to compare those notes so we can all learn together. Because, uh, you know, there's, you know, 10 analytics packages out there right now. You know, each one of you in your room, in your own world, can do your own analysis of which one. Um, or we can start to learn from each other, you know, here's the best one, and that saves everybody else a bunch of time. Same for, you know, the in-app networks, right? Which ones we can agree to use versus uh, ones that work versus don't work, that's what's going to lift the boat. So, you know, the answer to the, as an example, if I were to stack rank in-app ad networks, I would say, you know, it's whichever one you as a community choose to use. <laughs> that's going to be the most effective, right, over time. And until you do, do that, it's kind, of a, it's kind of a luck of the draw thing. Okay? Oh, no? Yes? Go. Other than the no notes that you have posted, uh, do you have any uh, examples from your experience that people have done to uh, tremendously uh, hurt, I guess, their ability to? You know, is there anything that companies have done that you've seen um, outside of your no notes that have hurt their ability to market their game? No. No. I, I think. I mean, some, you have some people got banned, which you could say is bad luck because they didn't know they were going to ba get banned, right? And they feel like they're just victimized, you know, because, you know, somebody took it out on them. But uh, I think, I think the, the bigger issue is people not trying the things because, oh, I tried the one thing I heard on the panel and that didn't work. And it's like, and so back to the playbook, man, there's 129 things to choose from. <laughs> and there's kind of no excuse after you have the game that you're not actively doing more marketing things to try and experiment and find out what's going to work for your game because it's all going to be different. And then, and then my plea to you guys is share it with everybody else in terms of what works because that will help us all, all do better together. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.